Hello, uh, my name is Billy Langsworthy. I'm from Mojo Nation, and I am delighted to be joined by Rainer Knizia, a prolific game inventor. And we're going to be delving into your history in the world of design and talking a bit more about some of your latest games. So, thank you for being here, Rainer. Well, thank you for having me. Good stuff. Um, so, if we kick off naturally at the beginning, um, I'm interested. It sounds like uh, you know quite a while ago, and it seems strange to think of the board game space without you, to be honest, because you're that prolific. But um, there was a time where you weren't a game designer. I'm interested in what did you do before game design, and how did the path to game design present itself to you? Well, the first thing I have to say is I have played games and essentially also invented games as long as I can think. So that's before my age of ten, I did my first designs, but. It was just for pure the interest of playing. I grew up in a small city, a uh, small town actually in southern Germany, and the only one who sold games was the barber shop at that time. Uh, so he didn't have an enormously great choice of different games, and I, my pocket money wasn't as big either. And so whenever I saw a fascinating theme like motor racing or whatever, then I made a game out of it and we played it amongst our friends. But Quite rightly, I never really intended or dared to become a, a game designer full time. So I, uh, of course, went to school. I studied mathematics, a bit of economy, a bit of physics, computer sciences, whatever is in there. Um, got my degree in America, got my degree in Germany, um, got my doctor's degree. And for a while, I couldn't actually think or actually imagine anything else but staying at university and uh, researching and teaching, which I enjoyed greatly. Uh, but through some industry contacts, um, I finally left the ivory tower and uh, went into industry, into banking and computer sciences. So uh, made, made a reasonable career there. Ended up in Britain, actually. Okay. Um, <laughs> went to Britain in 1993, stayed there for a long time. Um, until the Brexit, actually, which when I decided it was unfortunately time to go. Um, and so there I was um, heading a big mortgage company. And finally, I had to decide I cannot do both anymore. I cannot do the games and do the mortgage management job. It was a 300 people company, two billion pounds of new business every year. So it could keep you busy and it did keep me busy and on the other hand i had successes on the game side so i finally took a very aware decision uh, more than 20 years ago now and said okay i will jump i know i can never go back into management but that will be fine and i've never regretted it not that i didn't like the other side but i i believed i would have all the time in the world now to do games uh, no i have no time to do games there's so many other things to do in in a games business side, yes, but I'm full-time games now. Great. And have you ever been back to that Barber's to see if they've upped their board game? Uh, you might have some of your games in there now, fingers crossed. And my mother still lives in that town, but um, the house of the Barber is no longer there. Every, I mean, over the years, everything has yeah. changed. So I know it's still where the place is, but you would, there's no house there. And the house is no longer there in Austin. Never mind, never mind. And I'm interested, obviously, with that background, you know, the, the degrees in, in mathematics and that background, how much of that sort of skill-wise do you keep with you now in game design? Is there, is there much crossover, I imagine, that does help, actually, when it comes to working out certain things for your games? Uh, yes and no. Uh, mathematics is about building models, and games are, in a way, also a model of certain topics and settings. Uh, so with this respect, it helps. Uh, but there are many approaches to game design. And that's the good thing that each designer has their own handwriting. Uh, and that gives us a variety of different games. So um, I think it doesn't matter which area you come from. You always need to be careful not to make this as your only tool, because nobody likes mathematics games. People like fun games. And I, I have a favorite quote from a, an Austrian psychologist, actually, Paul Watzlawick, who said, if all you have is a hammer, then soon everything in the world will look like a nail. So don't come with a solution before you have the problem. And mathematics is not the solution to everything, certainly not the solution to game design. But it is 
an approach of mine that I probably see the world more scientific, whereas other people are more the storytellers or uh, the, the artists as such. Uh, and that gives different games. Absolutely. Um, and if we do dig in, dig into sort of your, your method, I'm fascinated by it. You have so many games out and, and sort of every year you have a few games out. It's not like once every three years we get we get one of your games there. There's always new ones coming out. So how do you uh, how do you come up with your ideas? How do you fuel your creativity? Where does that process start for you? Yeah. I mean, another quote. Hemingway said, uh, in order to write, you need to live. And I think in game design, it is also very important to look into the world with open eyes and to see what is relevant for the people today. So I cannot less, uh, rest on my laurels from the 90s where I did some very classic uh, tile laying games. Uh, the world is different today. And if I speak uh, to the students who are part of my testing groups, they don't know the Euphrates and Tigers and so on of this world. Uh, so that keeps you, so to speak, humble and say, okay, it was a different generation. Today, different things are asked for. So, but that doesn't answer your question. The, the, people always think it's so difficult to come up with an idea. Um, it is not actually. Because if, it, if games are per permanently on your mind, you, we have lots of ideas. It's either through just thinking and concentrating or looking into the world, or also a lot of things through discussions with the playtests around. Um, having a really good and strong idea is a little bit of a different matter. But very often, I mean, we have many bad ideas, yes, <laughs> naturally. So it, it is really to prioritize what is promising the most and then going for this. But for me, it's more almost a curse of the many ideas because having an idea, you can have a good idea within a discussion of an hour um, and it can really be very promising. But from this hour then emerges many weeks and months of work, of disciplined work to forming this initial idea into a perfect product. And there are many obstacles you have to take and there are many blind alleys you have to withdraw from. Sometimes you're lucky, I'm lucky, and it goes straight forward. Very often it doesn't and you end up somewhere completely different. But then I'm for not forcing myself into a specific direction, just saying I want a good game. And as long as it's not a card game as I intended, but a board game or then some other type of game, this is all fine. What counts is the perfect design. And if I'm not disciplined, I'll have many ideas. If I'm disciplined, I work on those which I'm already feeding and try to make them a perfect product. And that's what costs the energy and that's what costs the time and that's where all the play testing goes in. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you've got such an eclectic portfolio. Like you say, it hasn't been, uh, you know, you've not just doing one type of game, you've got lots of others and they cover a, a wide array of themes as well. And I'm interested, in terms of that part of your process, where does, where, where does theme present itself? Is it that right at the very start you say, well, I want to set my game in this world, or does that come towards the end, or how do you explore that? No. Initially, when I was a kid or an amateur designer, uh, I, or a hobby designer, I very often started with a theme. That was what fascinated me, and then I wanted to have that in a game, and I wanted to experience it through playing. Uh, nowadays, it's different. Of course, the ambition is always to create something new, to create something innovative. And it, it, it almost sounds trivial, but for me, it's actually a very deep wisdom. Um, I have the best chances to come up with something innovative if I start with something innovative. So I'm trying not to have a fixed methodology and saying, okay, here's the theme or whatever the starting point is, and then these 12 steps, and I'm always trampling along the same path. And then, no surprise, I would always come out at the same end. I do not want to come out at the same end. I want to come out somewhere else. And so it's probably best to start somewhere else. So I'm trying to find new entry points. I'm trying to have a fascinating starting point, and then, there is always a challenge because if you start somewhere else, then you cannot use your tools which you have developed. Uh, so you have to think anew 
and 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 that has the greater chance chance of innovation it needs more effort but i mean i don't want to create the 50th ludo game or the 20th monopoly game or the 100th monopoly game monopoly is very successful but it has been done so i want to do something new uh, and that's the ambition and with this respect new trends coming up in our industry i mean the whole electronic side or when the mobile gaming came up suddenly you have a small screen and nobody wants to read rules and then you suddenly have to rethink your whole approach and that i find extremely stimulating because you it forces you to give up all the old tools you can no longer use your hammer you need something else uh, and that i find very refreshing and so it helps me leaving the path Absolutely. And that, and that sort of leads on actually to my next question in terms of has your, it sounds like the answer will be yes, but what is the, some of the biggest ways that you've changed as a designer from those early days to, to how you design now? Is there anything key that you've altered in your, in your process? I've probably made it harder for me because uh, with such a big portfolio, uh, I do not want to copy myself either. So it is always, okay, I've done already this, I've done already that, so what, what is new? And with this respect, not living in a constant world, at the moment we have a, a big evolution, if not revolution in many areas, just look at the book publishing side with the eBooks and everything happening there, and with the new possibilities, maybe all the digital games, of course, it's quite a while, but with the mobile gaming, with all the possibilities, new production possibilities. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, new things happening. And um, essentially, the, the, the new approaches are important, but on a, on, a, on a whole, I think my methodology of, or, or my, my way of playing games and developing games has not really changed. I mean, I said I made it harder uh, because with knowing more games, with knowing more of my own games, it is more difficult to find something new. And we have so many novelties out there. So how do you stand out from the crowd? But the basic process of developing a game is you develop your concepts, you close your eyes, you look into new worlds, you play around with materials, uh, and then the most part is playtesting. Playtesting, analyzing, changing, playtesting again. It's an iterative process, uh, getting closer, getting further away again, then re retreating. And so inch by inch, you're getting hopefully to the perfect product. Uh, Nowadays, people call that design thinking. It's just common sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm interested, you've probably pitched, you know, more games than, than most people. And you've, you've obviously got so many games out there. So I'm interested, you know, as, as, as great it is, as, as it is to have a brilliant idea, you've got to be able to convey that idea, obviously, to publishers and pitch it and, and, and do that. So how, what is your approach to pitching? What, how, do you, how do you sort of nail that moment where you've got to convey your idea in a succinct amount of time? Yeah. Um, the first thing I need, one needs, is a good product. If I'm not convinced of my product, I would never put it in front of a publisher. Uh, and that's the challenge of getting a perfect product. But once you have that, and once you're convinced of your product, um, then, I mean, the pitch, I think the pitch is just a technique. It is just, so to speak, how do I summarize the game? If somebody is a book author, if somebody, I mean, everybody can hopefully can summarize what they do as a profession in a few, a few sentences or what products they are currently creating. So clearly when you pitch it, you don't want to explain the whole rules. I mean, you can see, I mean, if I visit publishers, then I have their full attention and we spend more time on it, go into more depth. But then a lot of times, uh, these meetings, particularly international meetings, happen uh, on the fairs. And then you need to see the, the other side, the people who are representing the, the companies, the publishers, they sit there in their cell all day, and every half hour, every hour, somebody new comes in and talks and talks and talks and talks, and it, it must be cruel. And so for me, it is clear I want to talk as little as possible, 
I want to give them a very, very three sentence overview of that. Um, more talking about emotions and what I feel and what is happening there rather than the details. And then if they get a sparkle, let them come because then they are active, because they're sitting all day, they're very passive. Yeah. But the secret happens much earlier. The secret happens to understand the individual publishers, to understand exactly what products they do, have good communication with them throughout all the time and see, are they planning something new? What are their experiences? I mean, I'm getting my royalties reports and I'm getting them from all over the world. So I have a probably, in some aspects, a much better understanding and overview of what happens in the world than any individual publisher, because I've worked with so many publishers. Of course, this is confidential and I will not carry it uh, around, but it gives me a good understanding for the markets. And then seeing the communication, seeing the catalogs, seeing the programs of the publishers is essentially the first very big success criteria to uh, make the right choices. I mean, as a hobby designer, you may only have three or five games to offer, so there's no choice to be made. Um, I have a big portfolio of published and also unpublished games. Yes. And so, and even if the game has been published in some markets, there are still other markets. We work very, very internationally. Yes. And so the, the, the big effort and the big energy with respect to selling and placing games goes into making the right choices. Uh, really seeing I have I have only probably 10 slots uh, which I can explain. Yes. So how do I reduce all the different games I could show them into the best shots? If I don't make the good shots, if I take games which don't really fit, I'm, I'm losing my opportunity. That's, that's much more the challenge than the actual pit. Or pitch. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. And do you think there's... Um, you know, you're obviously a name in the industry. You have an incredible track record. People have a, you know, especially publishers will have an idea of your past success stories, things like that. Does that make it any easier for you? Or is that, is that a trickier thing in terms of that sort of being known for what, what you're known for and having such a, such a massive portfolio? In a way, it makes it easier because the door opens easily. Yes. So if I approach a new publisher, the door will be open. Yeah. Usually. Um, so this getting this entry is is somewhat easier i think the reputation is very important and i believe we have a reputation that our games are and i say ours because there are lots of playtesters they are very well tested they are done to perfectionism so when the publisher looks at it the publisher does not really have to worry that the game might not work it's broken somewhere has an ideal strategy and all these things these, they are essentially guaranteed that uh, the game is from our view perfect. That doesn't mean that the publisher hasn't got some views what they want to change or do differently, but um, a lot of publishers approach us, for example, when they are in an urgency and say, oh, we lost something or we need something or there is an opportunity, we need something quickly, we don't have something. And then they know I have a rich portfolio, so we have lots of choices, but they also know if necessary, they can produce it very quickly because they can rely on the quality. So uh, this all helps uh, and it opens the door and the reputation, you, you work for your reputation, yes? I mean, you, you, need to, you deserve your reputation, a good one or a bad one, whatever you have. Um, but otherwise, people don't publish my games because they like me. <laughs> they only publish the games if they're good and if they're better than all the other games, they get offered from other people. So. Yes, the door is open, but the door is not only open for me, the door is open for many people. And um, I am in competition with everybody else. I mean, it's not a fierce and unfriendly competition. I think it's a very friendly relationship among the audience. And we openly exchange general feedback about publishers and experiences and so on, give each other advice, legal side and so on. Um, but it is, it is a competition and uh, of the better game. And so um, I'm only as good as my next game. Absolutely. And, and I'm interested, you've obviously like, you've got this portfolio of unpublished games. Do you ever close the door on an idea or have you had cases where an idea that you first came up with years ago, it has taken many years for that, that game to finally get signed? Do you sort of, do you ever close the door on an idea or have you got stuff in your, have you got stuff you're currently pitching that you've had for a very long time? When you say close the door on a game means abandon it and... Yes, and... It. Yeah, it can't be solved. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, these are the big disasters. Uh, 
in we when we have ideas and initially try them out and play a little bit with them and invest a few hours in the idea, most of the ideas die in this state. And that's okay because that's the normal way of creativity to explore things and to be very harsh initially. Uh, the big danger is to fall in love with a design, even so you somewhat know it's not going to make it. And then the, the, the sunk cost fallacy, uh, we wasted so much time, it has to work now. This is to be, I would actually say, to be avoided under all circumstances. And there are some, if you want, catastrophes where we have spent a lot of time into a game and we couldn't market it. It's rare cases. Um, and When I look at some of the games, maybe two, three years, four years later, and we couldn't offer, we, we couldn't place them, um, then for these games we couldn't market. I, I then find a reason with a certain distance that I shouldn't have done it, or I shouldn't. It's not quite there. Or it needs to be different uh, because the theme is not right, or because the whole position is not right. These are rare cases. They happen, uh, but I want to, as I said, I want to avoid them and. It's the good thing here again is because we have so many games in development uh, that there is a natural selection process. Always these come to the forefront, which really move quite nicely. I have my no, so far I have my fifteen drawers um, now with uh, COVID, as we are not can, cannot test at the moment. I secretly bought another thirty drawers uh, because. Every drawer has one game idea in development in, there, in different stages. Yes. Wow. So, of course, you cannot feed the 80 monkeys, uh, even if you could do full time testing. And so, uh, the ones which are exciting come on play next day and then again next day. And the one which isn't really going well, I say, okay, I'll look at this later. And then you move on to other things. And then I look at the drawer and say, I haven't opened this drawer for a whole year. So, what now? And then you have a much more distant way of looking at it. And knowing this sharpens your decision making and saying, is that really, should that go into a drawer? There are actually designs or concepts waiting to go into drawers and they're not just allowed to jump in there and occupy a drawer and then um, make work and all this stuff. So it's, it's a very careful decision which game actually goes as such, into, which idea goes into development. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm interested, you've, you've had so many games out, you, you, uh, you've got lots of classics that everyone knows, but obviously with a portfolio the size of yours, there's bound to be lots that people uh, either missed when they came out or, or aren't aware of. Is there any of your games that you think, um, you know, didn't get the credit it deserved, or you think, actually, I wish that one was, was up there with the ones that everyone always talks about? What, what, uh, what neglected uh, classic would you say people should revisit and, and shine a light on? Okay, I have many of them <laughs> who deserve better, but it's half half jokingly. It's, I mean, there are, there are games when I look at them which were published 20 years ago in some markets, and that was 30 years ago, and I look at them today and say, okay, they were good for their time, but they are no longer up to date, and therefore. I let them, I mean, rest in pieces is too hard to say. I say they had the time and it's good, and I'm, I'm not activating them again. But there are many games which are the classics or just nice games which come out year after year in different markets. And um, yes, these, these I would more follow through and, and, and bring them to market again and again. And you never know. I mean, some of my very successful games and well-known games like uh, Lost Cities, two-player game, um, when, when you know, uh, when, of course you do, uh, knowing the industry, there was the classic series of two-player games from Cosmos. So I went to Cosmos and said, look, I have a nice two-player game. They said, no, not enough to it. So, and then for one and a half years, I walked around and, and showed it to many people. And I got a lot of rejections. Um, people, I got such a lot of rejections because people didn't even want to take it to test it. They looked at it, I explained it. And, and so eventually I went back to Cosmos and almost bullied them and said, <laughs> I mean, I've not got the power to, to demand anything, but essentially I leaned on them and said, this is a good game. And then we, we talked about the bigger cards and so on. And look what big success it was. It was actually the origin for 
uh, for Celsius, which then won the game of the year and everything. Another example is uh, Picomino or Hackmaker, the worm game. Yes, um, nobody wanted it, and it had a different theme. So that also shows that success doesn't only come from my designs and my work. It also comes from the good cooperation with the publisher. And in this case, Doc said, put the chicken on it. And putting the chicken on it uh, certainly made a lot of the character to the game. And in the end, you can never say how much is it the ingenious design you have, or is it just having the, the wrapping around it in the, in the best circumstances is everything together. Which you have. So it is by far not clear when you get rejected if the game is really not good. And it is by far not clear if you have a very successful game that it will live for many decades uh, because times change. Absolutely. And, and I'm interested, is there a game out there, not from you, that you think, oh, I wish, I wish that was one of mine. I wish I'd been the, the mind behind that. Is there, is there one in particular that, not that you, I mean, you've got a lot of your own games out there, so uh, I understand if not. But. There isn't a particular one. Um, I am again and again surprised what people can sometimes do uh, with materials which have been there for a long time. For example, I remember when I was with uh, Richard Garfield, the inventor of magic, and who essentially uh, created by himself or essentially triggered by himself the whole industry uh, of collectible card games. He actually, when I visited him in the, on, the, on the West Coast in America, in Seattle, um, he showed me the game. And I actually said, Richard, this is not going to work. <laughs> it's too complex. Uh, I can hardly understand it when you explain it to me. Um, of course, he's a multimillionaire and he actually <laughs> shaped the industry with collectible card games. So I cannot say I wish I would have, uh, I wish I had uh, uh, created it because uh, I'm still convinced it can't work even so he has sold billions of them. So that also shows you your own experience is, is not always reliable with this research. I mean, now look at the uh, deck building games, another way to do something with cars. And you say, hmm, how could you, look, how, how does this come out of nothing, this brilliant idea, and again, giving a whole trend of things. So yes. I would like to create all the trends in the games industry. Unfortunately, there are other people who have good ideas as well. So um, I'm kind of panicky that I get these ideas before other people. I mean, there are ideas in the universe which belong to me. And so some people, they just have no respect. They go there and they steal my ideas before I have them. But once I see the game, I clearly say, well, this is my style. This should be my game. Yes. It's, it's I'm just not... kidding. But there is certainly, when I go over the fairs, certainly some kind of panic and think, oh, oh God, this was a good one. Um, and I need to go home and work harder. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and you mentioned Cosmos there. So it's good, uh, a, good, a good sort of launch into, into our next question about um, My City, which was obviously nominated uh, for Spiel Yara. Um, for anyone who hasn't seen that game yet, um, how would you describe uh, what My City is with Cosmos? My City is a legacy game. A legacy game is a new trend in our industry since a few years, where you do not play the game only once, but you play it, of course, you, every game gets hopefully played more than once, but the game changes. From play to play, something happens. New cards come in, you glue something, you put a sticker on the board. Um, so you always find yourself in a new situation, but it's not predetermined. It is for what you, what you do during the first game that influences the situation you find in the second game. Right. So that's the basic genre, so to speak, of my city. But so far, the legacy games have been quite complex. Uh, lots of rules, lots of materials, high prices, um, long obstacles to get into the game, uh, long playing sessions. And I wanted to open the door for the legacy type of games. I haven't invented the trend, so I thought, okay, at least I add something new to the trend. I open it to new players. And 
So the ambition was, and I think it has worked very well in this respect, um, to make a legacy game, which is for the casual players. Still interesting enough for the gamers, but for the casual players with simple enough rules so that you can read a page or two of rules or have it easily explained in five minutes, play the game, the game only lasts 20 minutes. Then you understand with simple rules and then there's some extra rules and then there are some more rules. What we are talking about with my city, of course, I should say is you have a little board in front of you and you build your own city. And you're always playing because everybody has their board and everybody is playing at the same time. Because in the center, it's just decided which of your buildings is played next. And then you put it on the board and you say, okay, and what if the big cathedral comes? I need to leave space for this. And I want to have a whole area of residential buildings, so better leave space. And now comes a factory and it doesn't fit. And where do I put it? So this is kind of the, the challenges and the dilemmas you're facing. So it's a little bit of a puzzle, uh, not a jigsaw puzzle, but a little bit of a mental puzzle. What do I do best? How do I solve this? But it goes very quickly. And after 20 minutes, you say, okay, Ah, this either worked very well, or no, I need to do a different approach, so you play again, yes? But of course, what changes? If you cut down the trees from the wood there, then the trees are no longer there in the next game, yes? And so um, we have structured the whole My City playing experience into eight chapters. So it starts with early settlements, and then come bigger buildings like churches, cathedrals, then come the gold rush or natural catastrophes, floodings. Uh, we then get the railways, and I'm not, not, not giving everything away. So you go through the time, and every three games, so for a good hour, you open a new envelope. New materials come out, new cards come out, new things. But it's not overwhelming you because old rules fall away, and you always have a little half page size. A diagram which shows you what is relevant in this game and what do I want to do. And so you really develop with the game and uh, go through the time with your city, get new buildings, upgrade your buildings, everything you could do, and you see what the others are doing. And in the end, after the 24 games, it is not really important who has, there is an overall winner because you collect victory points, but it really it doesn't matter who wins because. The winning is a good goal, but who in the end wins is, is irrelevant. If you had a good time, then everybody wins, of course. And that's, that's, um, and that's the short answer to your short question. What no, is my that, that's, uh, that's perfect. I'm interested, you know, that, like you say, this, this brings something different to that legacy, uh, legacy genre of game. The, the origins of this game, did it start with you thinking, you know, I want to I wanna tackle that as a, did you set yourself that brief? Did you say, I want to tackle that as an idea? Or did the idea come from somewhere else? No, this was a, we were looking for an, a game that makes an impact. And we were looking for a genre and we were discussing. Um, and it, it was quite clear that I wanted to do something on the legacy but I don't want to just follow and make a me too product. So the big decision was, okay, I mean, my approach is always simple rules, deep gameplay, have the people involved in the play, essentially the game being a platform where people can engage themselves and have challenges against each other or with each other, depending if it's cooperative or competitive. And so this was the, the, the starting point. The city wasn't there yet, and we looked at various themes and various approaches. And then the idea with the, with the city was nice because we said that actually is a very natural progression because cities progress through the time. And it's also clear that everybody could have their own city with the very big appeal that there's no downtime in playing because we can then create an engine in the game which gives us the challenges. So essentially everybody plays the same situation, but depending on how you play, you have a different outcome. And you, you cannot really complain, like, oh, because the other one has the same situation to play with. Of course, there's a bit of luck involved, how, how the order comes out and so on. And, and so it, it kind of all fell into place, uh, the initial concept. So this was one where we had little blind alleys. We had, it, 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 it developed really nicely. But of course, testing a legacy game is a bigger challenge because 
even so an individual game only takes 20 minutes, uh, if you change something in game five from the rules, maybe you already have to play different in game two, even so you don't really know what comes in game five, but I know and so I need to make it right. And then if you change game five, does that not have impact on game eight? So you, you need to keep the dynamics of the whole series of games and therefore we spend many evenings and then many complete weekends where we play through the whole session just with the same team and see uh, where does it go. So the testing is enormous. Um, even so you could say, oh yeah, but everybody changes it, so it's not my responsibility. Uh, not true. I think the game needs to be robust. That means the ambition is whatever you do, you'll have a great game. And therefore, whatever you do, it needs to be tested. And that's would have almost said work. I think that costs a lot of time and energy. Absolutely, and I'm interested. What made uh, what made Cosmos a, a good fit for the game? But also, you've um, you mentioned some other games that you've had with Cosmos before. Why are they Why are they a great partner in general for you? You know, over the years. Yeah, Cosmos was for my city actually my my dream partner and my partner of wish, my first priority. And uh, it, 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 I mean, there is a usual process where I visit a publisher once or twice a year and come back for the game. And so this was actually different. I actually called up Cosmos and said, I have a game for you, a special game for you. I want to show it to you. I would love if you could want to do it. Uh, so I visited them in Stuttgart um, and we sat there and we looked at the game. And they said, Yes, we see it. And it went on a very fast path. And we had a decision within four weeks which is unusual for any publisher, also for Cosmos. <laughs> um, and so we had that decision, but it still took one and a half years to bring it to market. So there's a lot of work, there's the, the envelopes and so on. But the nice thing is um, Cosmos is very professional in game development. And I said before, the game, a good game, a really good game is a, comes from a ideal cooperation between the author and the publisher, because both sides influence very much how the product looks like. And if that gels together, and if the relationships work together, then you, you, you have a good potential. There's no guarantees, but you have a good potential to get a very good game out. And Cosmos has also uh, the advantage that they are very well uh, in a network internationally. So I knew if the game is with Cosmos, then it will be in many different languages in many different countries. And that's, of course, important as well, because I want to reach many different people. And so um, it worked out as I hoped. And I think everybody in the end was very happy so far where we got to. And we have still got high hopes uh, where we can go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then my, my last question before we let you go, obviously we're talking uh, like this because, because of lockdown and because of the, the pandemic. And obviously a lot of the uh, game shows are going virtual um, this year and you know, who, who, knows what, who knows what happens in the future. Um, I'm interested to get your thoughts on, on how you think lockdown you know, has changed the games industry and, and whether, you think, um, whether you think there'll be any lasting changes, positive or negative, uh, in the industry that you're working in as a result of coronavirus and, and, and the lockdown? Well, we are probably, or sadly, only at the start of the corona crisis or the pandemic. Um, nobody knows how it is really panning out. If you look into the history, uh, some of the very serious uh, pandemics had two or three waves, and the later ones were even more serious than the earlier ones. Of course, we have modern technology, we have uh, potentially uh, the right medicine um, to overcome this, but we don't know. So um, it's very, the forecasts in the future are very uncertain usually. <laughs> um, but we can already see that Corona was not too bad for the game industry. Because, I mean, one needs to differentiate. If you have a brick and mortar store and you're sitting in the high street and everything is shut down and people are not coming, it's a catastrophe. On the other hand, when people are locked down, they or have to look after their kids uh, more, then games are a natural way to spend the time. And so the sales were actually not bad. It showed that the classic games, did very well. 
novelties usually had it very much harder because you, you didn't get the initial kick. Uh, but there are exceptions like my city where the kick came through it being special. Um, so uh, the, the spread of the games through the corona uh, situation uh, was actually probably more positive than negative. Um, the industry, many partners in the industry are suffering, and that means there will be certainly be people leaving the industry because they go insolvent or they, they need to change their business model. Of course, it moves more towards online shopping, uh, with some very big players. And so the traditional shops who bring the variety, who also bring very good uh, advice, recommendations, uh, guide you to the, to the right product, uh, may be lost more. But that's a general trend in our industry and in our world. So you can't possibly just put the finger on Corona. Um, of course, there's much more online play. But that has been there anyway. So I think, in a nutshell, what we get through Corona is just a, an acceleration of some trends which have already been there, like uh, home office and like doing video conferencing. So digitalization uh, has probably got a very, very big push. Uh, and therefore, the electronic games have, become a, have got push. Uh, but also the awareness that, that it's a really good time to play games. So um, I think the industry makes the best out of it. And uh, we are certainly an industry, the games industry, in a position to also can see our positive contributions to that situation. So it's not all a disaster. Absolutely. No, that's fascinating stuff. Well, a massive thanks again for, for giving up the time to uh, to have a catch up with me. Um, good luck with the rest of uh, my city and how it goes. And, and I'm sure... That, you know, that won't, definitely won't be the last game uh, we talk about, I'm sure, at some point. Um, so, yeah, massive thanks, uh, and hopefully we can, uh, we can catch up again very soon in person, hopefully. Well, thank you very much, and yes, um, hopefully the virus will soon vanish, and eventually, yes, of course, everything will be back to inverted commas normal, if it has ever been normal, um, and um, just getting out healthy at the other end is currently, I think, the main priority for us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Reiner. It's been a pleasure, and we'll speak soon. Thank you and bye-bye.